this, this is gonna be it. This is where my career as a creator, an artist, an animator, a critic, all dies before it even really got started. But you know what? I'm gonna commit. You saw the title. You saw the runtime for this video. And guess what? I'm gonna milk every goddamn ounce that I can proving my point. And after the fire fades, leaving this channel in ashes and ruin, a new world will be born from those ashes. And in that new world, I will finally have the chance to say, the 2010 Percy Jackson film is a better movie than the 2023 FNAF film. God, this is the worst idea I've ever had. Okay, like, I get it, I know. I'm fully aware of how crazy I sound right now, but please, for the love of God, hear me out. There is a logic here, I just have to get into it. It's hard to explain, but I promise you, there is a line of thinking here. Before I get into the details of this, I'm gonna preface everything by saying I am a huge fan of both these franchises. I've been reading the Percy Jackson series ever since I was a kid, and playing FNAF games at the same time as well. I've lived a lot of my two decades of life just inundated in the media related to these two franchises. I've played almost every FNAF game except for Pizzeria Simulator, and I've read all the Percy Jackson, Heroes of Olympus, and Kane Chronicles books. I have a deep history and love for both of these franchises. I promise I'm not trying to degrade either one by comparing these two adaptations, but I just want to talk about the mediums, how they work, and how adaptation works in general. I want to talk about fandom perception, I want to talk about headcanon, all these different things that come together in these two movies, and I think it's a pretty cool comparison. So let's just get into it. So without further ado, <sighs> let's do the thing. This is the most film bro -y I will ever get on my channel, I promise. So let me go a bit more into detail about this issue. The reason why I'm comparing these two movies is to understand the art of adaptation and how an adaptation separates itself from a movie. The reason why I chose the Percy Jackson movie and the FNAF movie is because one, views, and two, because they both show two very different ways of adapting media into film. And you know, I'm kind of a movie person. So the criteria I'm using for this is how each movie itself sits alone as a movie and how it sits alone as an adaptation, and then we'll combine those and see how they work together. I think by analyzing this, we can understand why some movies are hated more by general audiences or specific audiences, depending on what they did when it came to their adaptation. So let's start with the one that everyone hated. The Percy Jackson movie is bad. I don't think I'm raising any eyebrows by saying that statement. It's a pretty generally accepted truth. But here's the thing, why? There's a lot of issues you can point at in Fox's 2010 adaptation. It skips over major events that happen in the book, ages up the characters to suit the actors more than the story. It changes the style and look of many characters. The style of writing for the whole film almost completely ignores the general humor of the original story. And I can go on and on, but you see my point. There are a myriad of reasons for a fan of Percy Jackson and the Olympians to not like the Lightning Thief movie. The simplest way to say is that the film ignores the source material. In fact, the movie does this in such a way that it seems disrespectful to the original creation. And especially how Fox really planned to have Percy Jackson be a franchise, it seemed a lot more like a petty cash grab than any meaningful adaptation. Okay, now this is the part where I need you to stick with me. However, let's pretend you have never read or even interacted with Percy Jackson as a piece of media. Never touched a book, any of the graphic novels, not even seen a piece of artwork on Instagram. If you as this person walked into the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief movie, what do you think you would come out with? What would that reaction be if you weren't a fan? The interesting thing is, from most of the people that I've talked to about this, the reaction is essentially this. Eh, it was okay. Which is mind-boggling to a lot of people. How can it be enjoyable when there's so many missteps and errors about the entire film for a whole two straight hours? Well, let's try to look at the film from the outside. If you don't know that Percy Jackson and every other character is supposed to be around the age of 12, then you wouldn't question it walking into the film. If you don't know that there's an entire part of the story that takes place in St. Louis that's entirely cut out, then you wouldn't question it when viewing. Because despite how much the film takes away from the original source material, it does have a cohesive plot. Percy still finds out he's a demigod, he still gets framed for stealing the Master Bolt, he still finds it in his shield at Hades, and still returns it. Is it bare bones and kind of lifeless? Yeah, but is it still a story? 
Yeah. And here's the thing, while the movie is still bad in my opinion, I think there are a few scenes that I think actually deserve some praise. There's a few moments in the film where the energy from the Percy Jackson books actually seeps in, and it's really fun when that happens. Like the this is a pen scene is really great to me, and you can see where once the writing and energy is right, then the movie actually does seem good. Hell, as a VFX artist, I can still appreciate a lot of the animation and work that was done on a lot of the monsters. I'll say it, I think Medusa looked really good in that movie, even if the tension and action from that scene was completely taken out for some reason. I'll also admit that the film had such bad pacing and flow that it really threw its energy everywhere. Like, it's not Spider-Verse, but it's also not Grown Ups, if you understand what I mean. It it has a cohesive plot with actors that work if you don't know the characters, and comedy that lands sometimes. So at the end of the day, I'd say that the Percy Jackson film made in 2010 is a decent movie, but a horrible adaptation. So now, let's see what happens when you reverse those roles. I'm gonna say this once, please understand it is my opinion, however, the Five Nights at Freddy's game storyline sucks. Ignoring the movie, the books, all that type of stuff, the actual plotline that we can understand from the lore of the game is awful. Or at least to me, it is told and expressed in a really bad way. Look, I love lore videos and game theory as much as the next person. However, this, this, and this is not how you tell a story. I made this claim a while back and got a bunch of comments telling me that I was wrong, which really confused me. I thought we knew this. I thought the thing that was fun about lore dumping and studying through all of the different parts of the FNAF games was the process of studying through and ripping apart its pieces. Going through the puzzles and understanding all the different things that lead you to the final answer and getting that release of finally getting to the end. You know, the kind of maybe FNAF was the journey along the way type of thing. Cause Let's be honest here guys, this story is whack. If any of you guys have seen the multiple part series that MatPat did on the full FNAF timeline, you'd kind of know what I'm talking about. The dude had to embellish so many details about the story because a lot of it was still unknown. Parts of the story that were really important and made it a lot more interesting. I loved that video, but I knew that a lot of what MatPat was adding just wasn't part of what we knew. And also there's a million videos about how MatPat can be wrong on things, so we don't even know if the things that we're sure about, we're sure about. Like, for example, I want people in the comments to tell me, in a succinct, direct answer, why William Afton kills the first child. Seriously, do we ever get a motive? Is this something that I've missed over the past, like, decade of this game existing? And look, it's fine if we don't have, like, a realistic murder. This is a story about ghost kids and magic goo. I don't need it to be realistic. I just want something. Is it just because he's evil? Because we've never been told or even shown that Michael Afton is evil other than the fact he just kills people. What leads him to do it? Matt Pat concludes that it's competition with Henry Emily, but we don't know this! There are differences between guesses and theories, and a lot of FNAF is filled with guesses and not just theories. We have to fill in the blanks from the blanks that we are filling in because so much of it is not told. So then when it comes to a story, it makes it very difficult to create something that people actually enjoy and understand. And remember, FNAF was supposed to be Scott's final game until he moved away from game development altogether. None of this was planned out, which, to be fair, created a great feedback loop between creator and audience. But that also leads to a lot of retconning, a lot of changing of details, a lot of misunderstandings and incoherence. And maybe this is just a me thing, but to me, an incoherent story is a bad one. Hell, that's why I ended my analog horror series. I knew the story was too convoluted and I needed to tell it a different way. I tried retelling it over and over again, but nothing worked, so I decided to table it for now and maybe come back to it later. So with all that in mind, is the FNAF movie a good story? The answer? God no! If you try to walk in and understand the FNAF story these days, it is inherently so confusing that it is almost hostile to audiences. It's why explaining FNAF lore to people who don't understand it is such an impossible task. Heck, I'm still watching this freaking 9 hour video that tries to go through everything, and it still skips over some details. And here's something I'll admit, the movie did a really good job of succinctly placing different parts of the FNAF lore into a general plot. However, if you don't know this lore if you don't know any context of the story, 
none of it makes sense. Then it just looks like an entire movie of cheap jump scares, ploys, and underdeveloped characters. Now, I know what you're saying, I know what you're thinking, trust me, I already got it. I am fully aware that the FNAF movie was not intended to be enjoyed by general audiences. The creators of the film and Scott himself all came together and said this is a movie for the entertainment of the fans and no one else. And that is perfectly fine doesn't make it any less of a bad story though. The events in the FNAF movie to me feel a lot more like the re-establishing of a new canon. Basically separating the movies from the games and the books as a different universe where this is the understanding of how things happened. Which is fine, but if this is a kind of reset of the FNAF universe to be told in movie format, you could have told it more succinctly. Why on earth is Golden Freddy evil? Is he like the vengeful spirit that we know of Cassidy? Is he not? How should we know? We had no clue. There's no answers. Does the cupcake have its own soul? Is it separate from Chica? I don't know. Why does Bonnie look like he's zooted out of his goddamn mind throughout the entire film? The issue I have is that I don't trust the storytellers to not continue with the cryptic messaging that FNAF has always went through. And while in games where you can interact with the world around you, that's more than okay because we can actually try to find all the secrets ourselves. But in film, we have a lot less of that interactability, a lot less of that autonomy. So I worry that secrets will be kept from us, but we won't have the ability to interact enough to find the answers. We'll be stuck in the same loop that we've always been with the games, except we'll have less control and less ability over what we understand. Maybe it's just my own fatigue from the series, but I feel like that will just be less entertaining in general. However, if you are a fan, then this is one of the greatest movies of all time. And do I know it, Jesus Christ, I love this film. I love the campy nature and style of it, the amazingly made animatronics, and the great puppetry done by the team behind the film. The acting is honestly top notch, and of course Matthew Lillard is a god in this whole thing. Let's be honest, he's gonna carry this franchise on his back for the next like five years. The different cameos of YouTubers is really great. Even if Matt Pat f tricked me, I will never forgive you for that, Matthew. And hopefully, the king of the ready will be able to make an appearance in the next one. All these things are truly great, and if you are a fan of the series, makes the film one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had in a theater. Honestly, hearing the living tombstone at the end credits of the movie gave me the same cathartic release as hearing on your left in Endgame. It's just that great reward after so much time enjoying a franchise and finally getting to see it on the big screen. It's obvious that the creators, along with Scott Cawthon, really tried their best to make this movie for the fans and understood exactly what we wanted. We wanted joyful campiness. We wanted ridiculous comedy. We wanted childlike whimsy and horrific murder. And we wanted all of that packaged along with a few Easter eggs along the way. While the story may be incoherent, it doesn't make it any less of an enjoyable film. I like it to Spy Kids where it's such a fun movie to watch but makes so little sense if you actually think about it for more than two seconds. And that's not a bad thing, that's an enjoyable film, it's just a different type of it. So at the end of the day again, I'd say that the FNAF movie is a bad movie but an amazing adaptation. So film versus adaption. By now you might have noticed that you can have one or the other, but it's very difficult to have both. It's also very difficult to have neither, but that's definitely possible. Moving a story from one medium to another is a complicated task. If you're doing a book to a movie, a song to a play, anything like that, it's really difficult to fully encapsulate every detail because the medium is built to exist within that space. Changing that medium means changing how that story is expressed and changing how people view and understand it. The PGO and FNAF films are good examples of one or the other, but what happens when you do all or neither? In my opinion, one of the best adaptations and general stories ever put to the screen is the Game of Thrones series. I know translating things to TV is different than translating the film, but I'm making generalizations here. It's pretty well known that the Game of Thrones TV show not only stays very heartfelt to its source material, but is also one of the greatest shows of all time. Except for season eight, people people don't like that part, but we're gonna talk about that. The Game of Thrones books are massive in storytelling and plot. And yes, that story had to be changed a little bit when developing it into a TV show. However, by using the filmmaking tools of perspective and focusing in on certain characters, the filmmakers were able to stay close to the source material while fitting the story into a different medium. Let's be honest, reading Game of Thrones and watching Game of Thrones are two completely different 
different experiences. While you're definitely seeing the same characters in the same events, you feel like you're visioning them in different ways. That's using adaptation to its best benefit, changing how the viewer perceives the world that they're enjoying. By doing this, the adaptation becomes part of the media's culture. A version of the story that some people may like more, some people may like less, but everyone enjoys together. Now let's talk about what happens when you do the exact opposite of that. Drum roll, please. <laughs> That's right kids, we're talking about Avatar. This movie sucks. Not in the way the Percy Jackson movie sucks, and not in the way that the FNAF movie sucks. This movie is bad in every single possible way. This film directly disrespects its source material. We know this because the creators literally left the production. Imagine how rude your recreation of something has to be for the creators to actively dismiss it and walk away. I don't know, let's ask the Percy Jackson movie since it happened to them too. However, I do want to define a different between these two films. Despite all of its myths and magic, the Percy Jackson movie does have a cohesive, slightly realistic plot. There is a problem. Percy is framed for said problem. Percy has to stop himself from getting framed from said problem. However, M. Night Shyamalan's Avatar The Last Airbender tries to wrap an entire season's worth of problems into a single movie. This not only cuts out a majority of the story and a lot of the character development, but also then gets rid of any semblance of a cohesive story. The characters have less motive to do anything than purple guy, the actions they then take have no reason for happening, and then the actual plot points of the movie feel like a random string of events that have no correlation whatsoever. And since a lot of the story is taken away, they literally don't have any correlation, it's just incoherent. This is what I was talking about with the original FNAF story as well. When your story is incoherent and you don't have motivation or understanding of why characters have actions, then you don't have a good story, even when it comes to Avatar where they have all the story already done for them. At least with the FNAF movie, I can give an exception with the fact that the story makes absolutely no sense from the games. What's Avatar The Last Airbender's excuse? Nothing. It's just bad and lazy. And look, I'm stomping on a dead horse's grave here, but still. The Avatar The Last Airbender film is not just incohesive from a story's perspective, but also an adaptation perspective. It ignores both these sides and tries to throw in as much fan service as it can for what the Avatar franchise is. However, the creators of the film didn't understand that the thing that appeals people to the Avatar The Last Airbender franchise is not just the bending and the world, but the story that happens throughout it. In the FNAF movie, the appeal is the style, the animatronics, the horror, the giggles, whatever. While the story is definitely a facet of it, it is not the entire creation. For Percy Jackson, the story is the main draw of it, however, at least the creators got some semblance of a plot out of their messed up characterization of the original source material. But this? This is just a mess. A misguided, underutilized mess of a cash grab. And I agree, this thing should have never been made in the first place. But it was. So what can we learn from it? One of the first things we can learn from this is trust the creator. This isn't really for the audience and a lot more for movie studios who don't really understand how to do an adaptation because God knows there are way more examples than the ones I put in this video, but these studios really need to understand that they can't go through with a project if the creator does not sign off on it. Because every time a creator quits an adaptation, it goes so horribly. I think Hollywood's slightly learning its lesson these days, but still. Trust the people that created the source material that made it so popular in the first place. They will usually understand things more than anybody else. And then sometimes you have JK Rowling, which you just need to throw in the trash and forget that they exist. Lesson number two we can learn is that adaptations will always change something. If we as fans want an adaptation of a certain story into a different medium, then we have to accept that it will be different. I know most people actually know this, but I still want to talk to the people who have a hard time fully getting this part. Cause like, come on guys. We gotta let Percy be blonde, like we just have to let it happen, go through the motions, I know it'll be difficult, but it's okay, we can push through this together. I understand that people are really protective over the media that they enjoy, but sometimes when things change that can allow us to perceive them in a different perspective. I think we should let our stories change, evolve, and become new things as they grow. Yes, the original Percy Jackson film was a bad adaptation. However, I do know a lot of people that got into Percy Jackson through watching that movie. Yeah, they learned that the movie was a horrible remake of the book, but they really liked the book, and that's how they learned about it. It's a good way to get people to enjoy a new type of media, and I think it's worth trying, even if we really mess it up sometimes. Except for you, Shyamalan. You, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Lesson number three, 
Understand your audience. This is where the FNAF film excels. If anything, that movie is great at fan service. It provides that cathartic experience that people really want from putting all they have into a media for so long. That catharsis and energy that you feel sitting in a theater with a bunch of other people that have watched the same 70 MatPat videos as you have is really something special. It's a community, a family, if you want to be cringy. We are FNAF. That type of companionship and familiarity that comes from going through the same experiences together. The FNAF film knows this and leans into all it can as much as it can and does it in a really good way. I think we, as well as all other adaptations, can learn from that. And maybe adaptations in the future will think about their fans just as much as they think about the source material and the money. God, this video is long. I'm recording this before I leave for Thanksgiving break, so that means I'm gonna have to edit it when I get back, and honestly, I am not looking forward to dealing with all of this audio. God, I think I talk about FNAF for like five minutes straight. Oh well. You can tell that I'm pretty interested in subjects like this, so let me know if you want to hear me talk about stuff like this again, or if I should just shut up and keep making Pokemon animations. I do really like making the Pokemon animations, it's fun. But either way, that's all I got for this video. I've been Elias of Elias Entertainment. I love these stories, and I hope that they can be treated well in the future. Sure, there will be mistakes, but who knows, we might get something really cool out of it. Until then, we'll just have to see what Netflix has to offer. God, am I the only one that does not trust that trailer? Anyway, bye!